You are listening to the Scriptures for America Worldwide Broadcasting Network with Pastor Peter J. Peters, made possible by the tithes and offerings of the faithful. If you would like to be one of those who help to get needed truths out to others, send your support to Scriptures for America, P.O. Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. That's Scriptures for America, P.O. Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. And pay a visit to our website, www.scripturesforamerica.org. That's scripturesforamerica.org. At our website, we broadcast 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And remember, too, the live evening broadcast at our website with Pastor Peter Peters, Monday through Friday, 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern, 8 to 9 Central, 7 to 8 Mountain, and 6 to 7 Pacific. That program is live, controversial with guests and call-ins and taboo subjects not acceptable in mainstream media. That's at www. Dot .scripturesforamerica.org Should you go there on Sunday mornings, 10:30 a.m. Mountain Time, you'll see and hear Pastor Peter's Sunday morning church service. And when you write, why not ask for a free copy of the Scriptures for America Dragon Slayer Newsletter Magazine? Again, our address is Scriptures for America, PO Box 766, Laporte, Colorado 80535. And now, back to our program. It is time for Scriptures for America Worldwide with Pastor Peter J. Peters. All around the world, from the United States to Canada, Europe, Russia, South Africa, Australia, the Holy Spirit is stirring the hearts of godly Christians. The Bible says, quote, as an eagle stirreth up his nest, end quote. We invite you to stay tuned as Pastor Peter J. Peters shines the mighty light of the gospel on the source of our problems and the only solution. Please keep Scriptures for America in your prayers. And now, Pastor Peters. The message I'm going to bring at this assembly is part of a series of messages which I've entitled The Unseen War. This is part seven which I've entitled, The Unseen War, Why the Way of Balaam. I've tried to design each message to stand on its own, yet tie into the series. Since you people here have not heard the series, I'll bring you up to date by a brief review. Part one was The Unseen War, 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 You'd Better Believe It. And I tried to show in that message the physical evidence of warfare versus this physical evidence of warfare that's being waged in a spiritual plane. And we discussed in that message how we intuitively know that they are out there and they seem to be against us. In part two of The Unseen War, I subtitled it, The Concept. And there I looked into 2 Corinthians 4.18, which it says that there is the seen and the unseen, and how we can look upon the unseen and address that to a certain ex extent, and discussed how the concept of enemies are hard for us to accept. And I discussed why, because it's due to a conditioning process that's been going on with us by those very people. And I pointed out how we will still today say they. You know what, they want to do this, and they want to do that next, and so forth, but we've not quite brought ourselves to say our enemy instead of they. You just as well get used to facing it because as time goes on, I think our God's going to bring us face to face with, our, with the truth. And the truth is we have enemies. And in that message, I pointed out that in the physical realm of creation, God created natural enemies for about every creature out there. And sheep have natural enemies. They're wolves. And I pointed out in the spiritual realm that... The sheep have natural enemies. They're wolves, but we do not see these enemies as enemies because they wear sheep's clothing. I'm talking about an unseen enemy. And I pointed out that there is a new covenant, yes. 
But I'll have you know this, and you just as well get this truth down. It might not be popular at the present time, and it might not be politically correct, but I'll assure you the day will come when it will be standard public knowledge, and that is the new covenant was made with the same people in this book as was the old. And the new covenant did not eliminate the same old enemies that they've had for a long time. Now in part three of the Unseen War, I entitled it Cursed Enemies and Their Nature, pointing out that because the churches refused to accept the obvious teaching of the Bible, that we have enemies, the churches known as the Judeo-Christian churches, at the very best, present only half a Savior. You see, if you have no sin, you have no need of a Savior, do you? Well, if you have no enemy, you have no need of a Savior either. The Bible says that Christ came to save us from our enemies as well as from our sins. And in part three, we talked about the cursed people and their nature. And I tried to dispel this idea that's being taught in the Judeo-Christian church world that the only enemies you have are some kind of third heaven beings. And then in part four of The Unseen War, I titled it The Concept of Cursed Enemies. And I addressed briefly this false doctrine known as the seed line. And if you don't like it, don't let the door hit you in the chin when you go out. I'm getting rather disgusted with this seed line thing. If you want to believe it, go ahead. But I'm the one having to take the brunt of the stuff anymore with the writing about Pastor Peters across the country believing in that nonsense. And that's what it is. Now, we're going to have in this series of messages that are being sent out, one of the messages, hopefully, <coughs> by Charles Wiseman on this doctrine. But though I might not be teaching about the seed line, I am now trying to bring to your mind the concept of cursed enemies. Cursed enemies. And they have natural defense, as I pointed out in part four. They have a certain nature, as I pointed out in part three. That's entirely different. In fact, I read from their own writings in that part, showing what their nature is versus ours. In part five, it was subtitled, The Battle Plan, Dash the Way of Balaam. And that's taken from a passage of scripture, I think I'll have you turn there, found in 2 Peter, chapter 2. This is a very interesting chapter. It merits a lot of our time and study. But briefly now, I will have you look in verse 15 which says, forsaking the right way, they, still talking about they, have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam. The way of Balaam is their battle plan. And I pointed out in that message that Numbers 22 tells the story of how the cursed people expended a major portion or were willing to expend a major portion of their war chest in their war against physical Israel of old, to hire a man to curse them. And that's another concept that we've not been familiar with and haven't studied. And I guarantee you, they didn't teach me this in Bible college. But it's there in the Bible. The concept of being able to curse a people. How is it done? We address that briefly in part five. That brings us up to part six, which is entitled, The Way of Balaam in Other Words. It's sort of the rest of the story, so to speak. And the alternative method of cursing that Balaam came up with. If you read, or if you remember the story there in Numbers chapter 22, Balaam tried, but he was not successful, it would appear, in cursing Israel. But in part six, on the way of Balaam, in other words, I point out the rest of the story, if you will. How Balaam came up with the idea of how Israel could be cursed. And we went to the other words, such as the words of Josephus. We went to, to the Apocrypha. We even went to the Protocols. In that particular message, I pointed out a basic principle of cursing. The alternate method that Balaam came up with. You'll have to hear the message to know 
what it was in, in its entirety. It is going to be sent out, God willing, on the tape ministry. But if you turn over to Ephesians chapter 5, I will show you briefly the general concept of how our adversaries have followed the way of Balaam in being able to tap in to the power, the power of our God. It says in verse 6, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Now the wrath of God is just another way of saying the power of God. And they learned through the counsel of Balaam. He showed them a way that they could tap into the power of our God and turn it against us. It's called the wrath of God. It says, let no one deceive you for because of these things. What things? Well, such as verse 4, which starts the context. It says in verse, correction, verse 3, But do not let immorality or any impurity or greed be named among you. They know that if they can cause us to become immoral, that God will see to it that his word is kept. That's sort of the way of Balaam. And in that message on the way of Balaam, I quoted Steven Spielberg, who said this, Quote, film is the most powerful weapon in the world, in the quote. They are not entertaining you, friends. They are waging war against you. That's what they're doing. And in that message, I went to the book of Jude, verse 4. I read, for certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Now that ties right in with what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1 about people coming in with their destructive heresies, which I'm going to have Pastor Jones address at this conference, how they have brought those destructive heresies in over the centuries. But in verse 4 it says they have crept in unnoticed, what kind of people is he talking about? Well, let's drop on down. It says, who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know of any religion that denies that Jesus Christ is the great I Am who came in the flesh and dwelt among us? Certainly Judaism does it, doesn't it? What's he describing? People that follow this train of thought. And in verse 8, it says, Yet in the same manner, these men also, by dreaming, defile the flesh. I pointed out then that an example came to my mind was the movie Lion King. And in that movie, I had heard that there was a subliminal that people were seeing. And my son and daughter-in-law got the movie, and they found it, and they showed it to me. And what it is is a scene where the lion drops down on a cliff, so to speak, and the dust kind of comes up around his head as he, as he lays down. And as the dust swirls up above his head, it forms the words S-E-X. Now, I saw that with my own eyes. And my daughter was telling me how she had told some of her in-laws about it. And the response that she received, they wouldn't believe her. Now this is one of the natural defenses that God has given the cursed enemy so that they can remain unseen. Is our inability to believe that people would do this. Well, I'm telling you, I didn't make it up. You can see it yourself if you buy or rent the video. That's just one tiny example of what they're doing with the way of Balaam. And in that message, I pointed out how Balaam said, this is what you do. You get them enticed into their immorality. And they understand that if they can enslave us spiritually... If we have no control over our spirit, they break down the walls, and this is war that's going on. And so if you finally take an Israelite sheep and grab them by the nap of their neck and shove their head and say, Now look at that, you dumb sheep. 
That says S-E-X, and that's right there. And you force them to see it after they say, I don't believe it. Then you know what they say? Well, why would anyone want to do that? It's called war. They're waging war against your culture, against your God, against our morality, against what is right and decent and virtuous in this land. It's war. Well, why a war? And why do they do this way of Balaam? So I thought, well, I would just address that so. It has to do with identity. Now that word gets battered around a bit these days. But it does have to do with the identity, their identity, and our identity. For if there is a they, there is also an us. And that's what identity is about. In 2 Peter 3.18, it says to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you find yourself in one of these average Judeo-Christian churches, who, as I point out in my message on the four stages of spiritual truth, are mostly composed of stage two people, they look upon people who want to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ as people who are falling away rather than growing. Well, I got news for you. You just as well stand up and tell it like it is. Because one time or another, God's going to bring it out anyway. And there's no sense holding it back. Somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to tell. I had a man call me up this last week telling me that he had been to a civil air patrol meeting and there was a chaplain holding a, a session there speaking and finally one of the fellows in the story told me got up and said I can't take this anymore and he rebuked the man for bringing up Jesus so much and he talked about this elderly pastor who no doubt was a sweet gentleman they're all so sweet we don't need sweethearts anymore we need some men of God and as far as I'm concerned, if you don't like the name of Jesus, that's your problem, not mine. Don't let the door hit you in your fat head when you go. And it's about time to stand up instead of apologizing and say, if this song offended you, I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. We're not going to take this thing back by being sweet. You're going to take it back by being tough and standing like Christian soldiers on what's right. And if Jesus Christ is not the rock of ages, is not the cornerstone of the church, if he is one that we're ashamed to say his name, then we just as well hang it up and go home. People are backing down as our enemies come at us and war at us. You just as well stand up and in the growth process of growing in grace and knowledge, you see, our people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And I'm glad to have the opportunity. I believe one scripture to be true. He surely does choose the weak and foolish of this world. And I'm thankful to have the opportunity to stand up and step into the gap and tell the world knowledge that they need to hear because they're being destroyed for a lack of it. And you can call me whatever you want. It doesn't make any difference. They crucified my Lord. Call me a white supremacist, call me an extremist, call me a radical, call me whatever you want, but the truth is going to get out, if I have anything to say about it. So in the identity message, as we understand identity, we are now to the place that we are properly identifying who the true children of Israel really are. I think it's, the Lord has a sense of humor when you consider what the churches are teaching. They're teaching, the, taking the cursed people who spit when they hear the name of Jesus Christ. Their Talmud, which is their religious book, hates his guts. They stand against anything that's decent and moral and righteous and Christian. And the churches are holding them up and saying, behold, God's chosen people. You know, God has put them in a position that they either are going to humble themselves and there's going to be a lot of crow to eat. I appreciated the message that Charles gave today because in that message he said something to the effect of 
error and mistake is part of life. Remember that? And it forms the growing process. We've all had errors and mistakes, and none of us are perfect yet. We follow one who is. But we's getting smarter. And he pointed out in that message that an earmark of arrogance and pride is when you deny the truth and when you're not willing to admit that maybe you do have some things wrong. Well, God's got these churches in a position right now. They're going to have to do some admitting of wrong here. We discovered the us in the equation. It's like the Cinderella story. Ah, oh, shut up, Cinderella. Get back over there in the corner, you dirty little tramp. Big old fat sisters trying to stick their big toe in that little slipper. But every time Cinderella tried to come up, they barked orders at her. But you remember the Cinderella story? She was the only little girl that had the foot that would fit in that slipper. And I'll tell you this. The fat new foot cannot fit in that slipper that fits only on the foot of Israel. The Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, Scandinavian, and kindred people, the Celtic people, those they are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now that's part of the identity message. We've identified the us. And it's much like the Cinderella story. I mean, you can have an Afro-American student union. Uh, I drive by a place up there where I'm at that talks, it has right on the outside, Latino, uh, Latin American club. Or you can have, uh, I saw the other night on television in the motel, the uh, uh, Hispanic caucus that Clinton was addressing. And here a while back there were some white students at a university that wanted to have a white student union type club. Get back in the corner, Cinderella, you stinking, you stinking whitey. You've done nothing but destroy the earth. It's evil wherever you go. Isn't that the Cinderella story? Well, what's being done there, as I will show as I go on in this message, not this one, but the series, about curses, is that's part of the curse. It says in Proverbs 26.3 that the curse causeless shall not come. And I looked up the meaning of that word curse and it means to vilify, to cause to make light. The other word for curse that's used in the scriptures is declare to be evil, to make detestable. And what they're doing, what they are doing, they're good at it, is throwing a curse on us. Causing us to be vilified, to be declared to be evil. But we've discovered in this story the us. Now this has been discovered before. It's been understood. It was understood in the centuries before us. The book called Judas Scepter and Joseph's Birthright, which helped me immensely to finally get this picture put together, written in 1901, I think, it identified the us, but it had not figured out the they. It still had them as Judah, you see. Now, as this thing has evolved, I guess that would be a fair word, it means change. As we've grown in understanding, we have now come to the place that we have not only identified the us. Now, in the days gone by, when they had identified the us and understood that portion of identity and didn't identify the they, they did not come back upon them and vilify them and attack them. But today, they're starting to attack us, people like you and I, with eyes to see and ears to hear, because now not only are we figuring out who the us is, but we're figuring out who they are. That is part of the growth process. Now, back there in 2 Peter chapter 2, talking about these people, we're going to look at this off and on, through the series and in this message. It says, starting in verse 1 of that chapter, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. One of their methods of warfare is to secretly introduce destructive heresies. And I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to put it out, because I need to make a little bit of a correction. Keep your finger there. Go back to the book of Jude, verse 4. It talks about people who have crept in unnoticed. That would parallel with 2 Peter 2.1. It says in verse 8, 
that they have defiled by their dreamings. And it says in verse 11, quote, Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the air of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. I want you to notice there that they go the way of Cain. Now, I did a two-part message quite some time back on that subject called the way of Cain. Anybody heard those messages? All right. It was called the way of Cain. And in there, at the beginning, I made a mistake. I said, you know, the origin of Cain is a mute point. We can't do anything about it. We need to understand the way of Cain. Well, I need to correct that a little bit because, you know, we're, we make mistakes. And I made a mistake. Let me tell you something. The origin of Cain is not a mute point. I was trying not to offend some of these seed liners, and I don't matter right now if I offend you or not. That is a destructive heresy that's been brought in by themselves. Pastor Jones, didn't you bring a message a few years ago showing how the seed line doctrine came right out of the Talmud and was also Masonic? Yes. I carry that on the ministry, don't I? Yes. What's the title of that? Uh, who, fathered Cain? who fathered Cain? Oh, people got all upset. You know, I've given up trying to keep from getting people upset. Kind of reminds me of the story of this fellow that we got on the train. Chicago, he was headed to Syracuse. One of those sleeper trains. And he came to the porter and he said, Now, here's $15. It's very important that you get me up in the morning. The train gets into Syracuse at 5.30 and I'm a solid sleeper and I wake up in a lousy mood. I don't care what I say to you. I don't care. If, don't matter if I cuss at you, hit at you, whatever it is. You get me up and get me off that train and get my bags off. And here's $15. Well, the guy woke up. 10.30 in the morning, the train was pulling into uh, New York. Man, he got all upset, and he went and found the porter, and he grabbed the porter. He said, you no good porter, give me back my $15. You could cost me my job. I told you to get me off in Syracuse at 5.30, and now here I am. Give me that $15. And the porter stood there next to his friend, and he reached in, gave him the $15. The guy said, Hoo! pushed him back, and he said, mumbling off, he said, no good porter, and walked away. And the porter's friend says, man, he was really mad. You really made him mad. He said, well, if you think he was mad, you ought to have seen how mad the guy was that I put off in Syracuse. <laughs> so it seems like I make everybody mad these days. Well, if you have found yourself being offended by the truth, that's your problem. You take care of your own arrogance and pride. And that is a mistake if you bit into that lie called the seed line. Now, the reason I'm hitting on that a little bit is because, well, for example... I got this letter just recently, came from New York, this is what it said, quote, Just thought you might like to know you're being blamed for those arsons in southern churches. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> now Pastor Peter's getting blamed for those churches getting burned down there. Read the flip side of the, of the story. They're really, they really managed to paint you with the broadest of brushes, which I'm sure is nothing new to you. But can you believe that part about Cain siring Jews by intermarrying with mud people? Where did they get this sort of stuff? I've never heard you mention anything close to that. Well, don't, I got the article. It came, this article, published in some minister's magazine, called The Ugly Face of White Supremacy. I won't go in great depths of the article, but it says, quote, what are the Jews? Identity teaches that the Jewish race resulted from a sexual union between Eve and the serpent. And then it goes on to say, This is one of the reasons why identity pastor Pete Peters of Colorado teaches that races should never intermarry. And it goes on to talk about Pete Peters. Well, I'll tell you what, if you want to believe it, believe it. Will you tell him I don't teach that? And tell them why I don't teach it. I don't teach it because the Bible doesn't teach it. That's why I don't teach it. We are properly identifying who they are, however. But if you go back to 2 Peter, chapter 2, describing these people, it says in verse 14, quote, having eyes full of adultery, and that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed children. 
Now I read that from the New American Standard. The King James says, cursed children rather than accursed. means the same thing. Now I want you to know what it's talking about. It's talking about people who have been born under a curse. Cain was cursed. And the people born from his lineage were born under a curse. I don't deny that because that's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches us things about the cursed people. And this is a new concept for many. This whole series for some will nearly blow them out of the water, so to speak. Because sometimes truth is so hard that they've never heard this kind of thing. But Cain was cursed. He's not the only cursed person, though. Canaan was cursed. I feel sorry. You talk about, oh, how come Pastor Peters gets blamed for being a white supremacist and down on black people? I've never called black people in my life mud people. I wouldn't do that. But I tell you what I don't do that the churches do. I don't say that what the churches say in the land. They say that Canaan was cursed and so God turned him black. And I get all black. And they get off scot-free. Now you tell me, is that right? <laughs> no, it isn't right. Well, if I was a black man, I'd be quite offended at some stupid Baptist preacher that gets up there. It doesn't have to be Baptist. It could be, who well, God only knows how many people teach that out there. That, well, Canaan was cursed. That means he became a black man. That'd be offensive to me if I was a black man, wouldn't it to you? Don't pick on Peters. <laughs> Go after these guys. I'm just telling you the truth. The truth of the matter is Can Canaan was white. Shem, Ham, and Japheth had the same mama and daddy. They had to be the same color, right? And Ham's descendants had to be the same color as he was because they there's nothing in the context that says he went out and married into another race. And these churches say, well, we don't believe in evolution. Don't you give me that nonsense. Why don't you at least come clean and be honest? You are the greatest evolutionist out there. The only difference is the, the average evolutionist that has a measure of intelligence, a measure, in the universities takes millions of years for evolution, and the churches have got evolution happening in a couple of centuries. They go from Shem, Ham, and Japheth to just, what is it, just a few hundred years, you got the Tower of Babel, and the next thing you got all the races. You say, well, what happened? Well, they moved the, down to the equator and they changed it. Well, that's evolution, you dummy! Isn't it? We just as well offend everybody. <laughs> Esau was a cursed individual. We won't have time to go into great detail on the curses, but I do want to just give you an example. Turn to Genesis 27, because there is a parallel in the curse that Esau had. Now, it's not identified as such as a curse. Esau was cursed twofold. One is he married into the Canaanite lineage. The Canaanites came from Canaan who was cursed. And so Esau's descendants were cursed because, as Mr. Wiseman pointed out, it's a dominant factor. But also, he was cursed in the fact that he did not get the blessing. So he got the opposite. And as you look in Genesis chapter 27, you'll see something that's very similar to Cain's curse. It says in verse 39, and I'm going to read it to you from the New American Standard, and I've checked out the other translations, and I think it's right on. It says, Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling. Now, the King James says, The fatness of the earth, does it not? And I'm not quite sure why that discrepancy Except I know as I check the other translations that this is accurate. He's saying against the, away from the fertility of the earth. And I think what it means in the fatness of the earth, and I'm subject to correction here. I don't have it all figured out. But basically Esau's descendants are scavenger type people. They have to live off the fat of others. You see what I'm saying? But they live away from the fertility of the earth. Now, if you turn over to Genesis chapter 4, you'll see that Cain was cursed. And let's notice the similarity in the curse. In verse 11, I read, quote, 
And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. You shall be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear. In the quote. Now I read Genesis 4, 11 through 13. Notice there that he also was cursed from the face of the earth. Did you notice that? There's the similarity. Cain said in verse 14, Behold, thou hast driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from thy face I shall be hidden, and I shall be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, and it shall come about that whosoever finds me will kill me. Why would Cain say, whoever finds me will kill me? Why would Cain say that? Why? Why would they, you know, I, even though I might get labeled as some crazy and a white supremacist and all these things because I try to tell you the truth, I don't go around saying, well, whoever finds me will kill me. In fact, I feel quite secure in the arms of my king. But why was he so concerned that whosoever found him would kill him? Have any idea? Some might say, well, because he killed his brother. No, it wouldn't be that because... You say, there were not two witnesses. Why didn't God put him to death? Why didn't somebody else put him to death? Because it takes two witnesses according to the law, does it not? And I think the answer is this. He knew what his lot in life would be and what kind of person he would have to be to survive. The point is this. Very simple, basic economic truth. All wealth comes from the soil. And he had now been cursed away from the soil, away from the face of the earth. You see the point? So how is he going to eat? And once people figure that out, they'll have the idea, hey, we need to do to you like we do all parasites. See the point? How is he going to eat? And the answer to that is the answer to the question, why the way of Balaam? Turn to Hosea chapter 4. Read with me, please. Verse 8. They feed on the sins of my people and direct their desires toward their iniquity. Make sense? Are we getting smarter? They have to follow the way of Balaam. If they are to survive, they have got to have a sin. That's why they're putting SEX in the little cartoons. That's why they are directing us towards our iniquity, our lower nature. See the point? As I pointed out earlier in this series, we have made a mistake. It's been taught in the churches, and we've kind of believed it, and that is this. We have believed that men would be happier and more prosperous if they would follow the law of God and have the laws of God implemented in their lives and their society. That is a lie. Because, see, we've assumed that all men are the same. That is a lie when it comes to the cursed men. The cursed men will not prosper. They will not be happy. They cannot survive if we follow the laws of God. They feed on our sin. To prove that, turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 28 to drive this point home a little bit. There we see the blessings and the curses. It's also in Leviticus, I think, chapter 26. But one thing we have not noticed. We have noticed in identity as we've come to the truth. You see, another truth we've had to come to is that the churches have been lying to us when they told us that God's law was done away with. We had to go through that theology, didn't we, and get it all figured out. And then when we figured that out, we figured out, hey, we would prosper. And we would be more happy and healthier if we followed God's law. But we forget the flip side of it. And the flip side of that is seen in Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 43 which says, quote, The alien who is among you shall rise above you higher and higher 
but you shall go down lower and lower. He shall lend to you, but you shall not lend to him. Notice the flip side is the alien. Those who come in amongst us, they appear like us on the surface. They prosper when we sin. Make sense? Driving it on home more over there in Proverbs chapter 5. It says this, starting with verse 1. My son, give attention to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding that you may observe discretion and your lips may reserve knowledge. For the lips of an adulteress drip honey and smoother than oil is her speech. But in the end she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Drop on over in this chapter to verse 10. He says in verse 9, Least you give your vigors to others and your years to the cruel one. Least strangers be filled with your strength and your hard-earned goods go to the house of an alien. What happens when they entice our children into immorality? The hard-earned goods of theirs and their forefathers go into the hands of the aliens and somebody's getting rich off of this sin scam. And see, that's the only way they can survive. They cannot survive in normal ways. They've got to come up with the sin scams. They've got to come up with the Ponzi games of insurance. They become the merchants, the intermediates. They become the the scavengers of society. They run the junkyards and the rag merchants. This is the way it is for those people who are cursed. Make sense? Why the way of Balaam? Because of identity. They are wolves. And how do wolves eat? What do they eat? They eat sheep. The protocols. Protocol number 11 says, quote, The goyim are a flock of sheep. We are their wolves. You know what happens when the wolves get a hold of the flock. In the quote. That's in the protocols. I had a man come to my church the other day. An elderly man came with his two sons who discovered identity hearing me on the radio. They brought their dad, and he was kind of a retired farmer out in Nebraska, and he was telling me the story about years ago he'd went to Omaha with some cattle. I think it was Omaha, and there was a packing plant there, and that evening he was eating in a restaurant, and the owner of the packing plant came in who was Jewish, and this is what he said. He said, you know, you farmers are just like sheep. You come in here and we fleece you, and you grow out, and you grow more wool. In the quote. (laughs) He understood They go to the left. They have to. Here is a quote that comes by Dr. James Perkins in the Jewish Review of London, March 1934, page 29 and 30, number 8. This is what he said, quote, It is not an accident which has made Jews form so large a proportion of socialist leaders, end of quote. They cannot go to the economic social system on the right because they would starve there. They cannot prosper there. They have always got to go to the left. They are the leftists. Someone has compared socialism and communism, that type of thing, to, for example, the the socialist is, if you have two cows, the socialist system, you keep one cow and you give one to your neighbor. In a communist system, if you have two cows, you give both your cows to the government and they give you some milk. In a fascist system, you keep the cows, you milk them, give the milk to the government and they sell you the milk. In a New Deal system like Roosevelt, you shoot one of the cows, milk the other one and pour the milk down the drain. But in a capitalist system, You take one of the cows and sell her and you buy a bull. You become productive. But they cannot produce that way. I didn't make this thing up. Here's a quote that I didn't make up either. Quote, Judaism is Marxism, communism, in the quote. That's by Harry Watson, a program for the Jews, an answer to all anti-Semites. New York Committee for the Preservation of Jews, 1939, page 64. They go to the left, we go to the right. Goats go to the left, sheep go to the right. They are predators. 
And this is all part of God's plan. Why does he have them follow the way of Balaam? Because he wants us to learn war. You say, man, this guy's getting further out by the minute. Well, let me back it up with scripture. Turn to the book of Judges, chapter 3. And before I read it, let me make a simple point, And that is this. You cannot have war if you have no enemies. God said this to the Israelite children of old in verse 1. Quote, now these are the nations which the Lord left to test Israel by them. That is, all who had not experienced any of the wars of Canaan. Only in order that the generations of the sons of Israel might be taught war. Those who had not experienced it formerly. End the quote. The nations that he left there were the people who were a people of the curse. Cursed people serve a very important role in God's sovereign plan where he wants us to learn war. Am I talking about physical warfare? No, I'm telling you about the unseen war. I've already told you that if we try to take this on in the physical plane right now, we lose. And that's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 some words about war. This is what he said. 2 Corinthians Chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. I'll stop there a moment and say this. If I were them, I would not want us to discover those weapons. I would want to prod us into going into the physical plane. Make sense? And in verse 5 it says, We are destroying speculation and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. But if we're not going to obediently believe the truth, the truth that we have enemies, that they are waging a war against us, using the battle plan called the way of Balaam, and acknowledging the obvious is that is that's their only way for survival, then we will not be victorious. We've got to start with this knowledge. We are destroyed for lack of knowledge. As I go on in the series, I will give you knowledge on how they curse us. Because this is what cursed people do. They curse God's people. So stay tuned. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Pastor Peters, and I hope you've been enjoying our series entitled The Unseen War. Now, it won't mean anything to you unless you have figured out by now that somebody is at war with us. Now, think about it. How many times do we hear people talk about, you know what they want to do next? They want to do a national ID card, or they want to raise taxes, or they are kind of, well, if there's a they, there's an us. And us are beginning to figure out that they are against us. This is a spiritual war that is going on and has been prophesied in Scripture. But God's people are blinded to it. Now in Isaiah chapter 52, we have a prophecy showing that that blindness will soon be released. And people will again see. Listen as I read. It says, Awake, awake. I'm going to stop there. What does that mean? They were asleep. It's like a spell. And this has been going on. Our, we've been losing our borders, our, our sovereignty. More and more of my, our money is taken. Jobs are going overseas. People are finding out that they can't even speak out against sin, such as homosexuality, or proclaim the name of Jesus Christ publicly. But it says, awake, awake. There is going to be an awakening. 
And then it says, clothe yourself in your strength, O Zion. Clothe yourself in your beautiful garments. What's the first thing you do when you wake up? You put your clothes on. What does that mean in the spiritual realm? Did you know that the scripture says in Galatians 3.27, All ye that were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. I won't get off on that. Boy, I want to tell you, though, we do have a little booklet we'd be pleased to send you. We'd love to send you free of charge called How to Become a Christian. Do you not find it interesting that there's no place in Scripture that anybody was ever told to accept Jesus as their personal Savior? To become a Christian? No one was ever told to just believe on Him? What's going on here? I'll tell you what's going on. 1 John 5, 4 says, Those born of God overcome the world. Now that word overcome means conquered in the Greek, and the word world means world order, and born of God means being born again. And Jesus said in John chapter 3 that if we were to have the kingdom, we must first be born again of the water and the spirit. And those who are at war with us are doing everything to keep us from this truth of how to clothe ourselves or put on that beautiful garment of righteousness that comes through Christ. But let me pause right here. You see, I'm giving you a mini-sermon, I guess, between these sermons that we are playing called The Unseen War. But I want you to know that if you write to us, we will send you free of charge our little booklet, or if you want it on CD or cassette tape, we'll do that too, called How to Become a Christian. Take this address down, won't you? It's Scriptures for America. Post Office Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. And that's the address you need to have to send us support, and we need your support with the amount of broadcasting time we are doing these days, getting the truth out and awakening God's people to the war that's going against them. Again, the address is Scriptures for America, Post Office Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. Well, let this preacher get back to this prophecy. Awake, awake. Clothe yourself in your strength, O Zion. Clothe yourself in your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For the uncircumcised and the unclean will no more come unto you. Shake yourself from the dust. Rise up, O captive Jerusalem. What's that telling them? They were asleep to their captivity. That's what it's saying. Shake yourself from the dust, rise up. What's that mean? They were going lower and lower, just as God prophesied would happen to his people in Deuteronomy 28 when we turned away from him and his law. He said the alien who is amongst you, and that means a lot more alien than what you might think. Don't want to get off on that too much. It's too far out of the box for some of you, but these alien creatures who look like us, are going higher and higher, we're going lower and lower, as was prophesied about us when we left our God. And it says, O captive Jerusalem, loose yourself from the chains around your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. They had been made captive, unaware. How did this happen? It happened through the unseen war. Now, We've got 13 messages. You just heard one of them on the Unseen War. I've got it in manuscript form, but I never have got it printed yet in book form. But if you'd like to have all 13 of those messages, which are contained on C60 cassette tapes, or if you prefer, we can put them on CDs, we'll send them to you. We're making a special offer to find out who's out there listening to us. This is a value worth $65, and we're saying send us a $45 offering, and we'll send you all 13 of those sermons in that series, The Unseen War. The Scriptures for America address is Post Office Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. That's Scriptures for America, Post Office Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. About 15 years ago, this preacher wrote a book called America the Conquered. We've been conquered by an unseen enemy and an unseen war. Maybe you don't listen to tapes that much. 
Maybe you'd like to read a good book. Well, here's a good one for you. I'll be back right after telling you how you can get it. Stay tuned. The ancient prophet Isaiah foretold a time and a people who would awaken one fearful morning and discovered they'd been conquered while their watchmen slept. Could they have been speaking of today? of America? As we sink ever deeper into economic chaos and moral decay, some people are realizing that Christian liberty is almost gone, subtly replaced by the heavy chains of slavery. Within a single generation, our public life, schools, music, literature, and entertainment have been infiltrated and seized by any Christian groups, and our youth, our most precious treasure, have been ensnared by drugs, immorality, self-mutilation, violence, despair, and suicide. Awake America, awake! Right for for America the Conquered by Pastor Peter J. Peters. The book is available for a $10 offering. The cassette album for a $25 offering. That's America the Conquered. Write to Scriptures for America, Box 766, LaPorte, Colorado, 80535. But someone out there is probably saying, don't you know, preacher, that America and Canada, they're not in the Bible. Nor are those other nations that are hearing us on this worldwide shortwave broadcast. You know, the greatest mass migration that ever happened in the history of mankind was the migration of the Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, Scandinavian, Celtic, and kindred people coming from Europe and the British Isles and so forth to America. And so we are told those people are not in Bible prophecy. Think again. Oh, there's so much I'd like to tell you, but right now I just want to tell you this. There is a war going on. You've heard one of the messages in our series of messages called the Unseen War. If you want to keep hearing us on the radio, we need your support. You send it to us at Scriptures for America, Post Office Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535, and we'll keep sending out truths that no one else seems to be getting out there. The truth is, America is in Bible prophecy. There is a war going on. We have had conquests right before our eyes. We are going to wake up, and there is something we can do. But I can't tell you any more than that, probably for right now. I've probably told you enough, but I want to keep telling you our address so you'll order the material we offer, and f so some of you will support us, because we need it. We're going full speed ahead. We're pulling out all the stops, and we are broadcasting. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week on our satellite, and a lot of hours on Worldwide Christian Radio. The address again is P.O. Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. Take that down. It's Scriptures for America, Post Office Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. And now before the next message in the Unseen War series, I think we'll tell you about our introductory packet. A lot of people are trying to get to know us, and we're trying to get to know them because we are coming new in new spots on worldwide Christian radio broadcasting. So here's how you can get our introductory packet. If you haven't done so already, we encourage you to send for our introductory packet. It contains our large catalog, a special discount coupon, a finely printed copy of the Congressional Law which declares the Bible to be the Word of God. It also contains a current copy of our newsletter and information on how to receive it and on how to subscribe to our tape ministry. You can receive all of this by writing to Scriptures for America Worldwide, Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535, USA, and asking for our introductory packet packet. Your $2 offering U.S. funds would help cover a part of the cost of sending it to you. That is a $2 offering U.S. funds. Write to Scriptures for America Worldwide, Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535, USA. Thank you for your prayers and support. 
the gospel according to Matthew chapter 10 we read quote go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel end quote when Jesus Christ spoke those words to his apostles who did he mean by the lost sheep of the house of Israel if you would like to receive four tapes every month with biblically sound preaching on this and other important subjects write for information about our tape ministry write to scriptures for America Worldwide, Box 766, LaPorte, Colorado, 80535, USA. Again, that's Scriptures for America Worldwide, Box 766, LaPorte, Colorado, 8053.